Speaking of difficult positions, in your Armageddon game against Irina, you uh, released the bishop and on g4 and lost a piece instantly in a game that you had to draw. When that happened, were you thinking this game's over or were you thinking I'll still fight on? Well, I mean, I have to be realistic, which is I, I just lost a piece on move eight down a minute in the Armageddon game. It's like pretty much over, but you know, there's always a chance there. So I, cause a lot of people came up to me after the game and was like, I'm very impressed that you didn't resign. And I was thinking about it and I was like, I never consider resigning, <laughs> which I mean, surprises some people. But the reason I really thought that was, let me just lose in like three, three more minutes. You know, it's such a short game. Why not just play it on for a few more moves? And then when it's completely over, she trades stuff off. Okay. Didn't resign. Welcome back, everybody. Episode 9 of the C-Squared podcast. We are here with a very special guest, uh, Woman Grandmaster Jennifer Yu, the 2022 U.S. Women's Chess Champion. Jennifer, welcome to the pod. Thank you guys for, ha for having me. Really happy to be here. Uh, so how's, uh, how's things been since uh, you became uh, the national champion? I would assume you went back to school and everybody's like super happy. Everybody's uh, congratulating you for this huge accomplishment yeah yeah i'm back in my little dorm room right now um yeah it's been kind of crazy you know so many people who i didn't even know like follow chess have come up to me it was like oh i watched your playoff um I watched the bishops and it, it's just been really great um being back but uh also like i have to catch up on schoolwork so it's just kind of chaotic but i'm really happy right now is, is that a big problem for you whenever you come back from a competition and um just so that our audience knows you are actually going to harvard uh you're right now a um sophomore correct me if i'm wrong so uh, i would assume the first year was much more difficult for you you actually missed the u.s women's chess champion in the first year right is that correct yeah um i decided to skip out on last year's championship just because i thought the adjustment to college um i mean it is a big adjustment and i didn't think it made sense to you know do it along with like missing a couple weeks of school because i honestly don't think i could have like handled it that well because it was a new experience um i was also just getting used to you know college life in general and you know making friends and it's just like oh um too much going on for it to make sense i think but i was really sad i couldn't play um but i'm glad that i'm back this year because now i kind of know what to expect and uh it was just like I was able to do work along the tournament. So um, I think it really helped now that I'm back. But um, like for my whole life, it's like I've done this like, throughout high school. Um, and it's always like the month after a tournament that's the worst because you're just completely out of it because you have to make up all the work. What are you studying at Harvard? Oh, uh, right now, oh, I'm studying econ, economics. I did that as well, actually. I did international political economy. How do you like it? Right now, I mean, I like it, but I haven't taken that many like in-depth courses yet, like really specific courses. I've kind of just taken like the general, you know, macroeconomics, macroeconomics kind of courses. But um, I'm taking like some other classes as well that fulfill other things. So I'm kind of taking a wide range of things. I only have one econ course this semester, but um, I find it really interesting. Fabi, do you want to go back to school? We have a connection. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I do too well. <laughs> we have I a connection. It's been a long time for me. <laughs> but actually, how do you how do you feel about balancing chess and uh, and going to, to university and schoolwork? Because I, I imagine that it's very difficult to focus on both with the intensity that you need to uh, to maximize your potential. So it's a, it's a learning process for me. Like I do not even I'm not even close to having it down. Um, so this was like my first experience with doing both at the same time going into this U.S. Championship and. I think there's definitely a lot I would change in the future. Like I would want to do more chess prep before the tournament next time I do it, just because this time it was, you know, I did prepare as much as I should have. And like during the tournament, I also had, you know, could do as much chess I wanted to at the tournament because I was also thinking about school. So it was just kind of like, um, I was just kind of caught in between both. But now I, I feel like I just have to like, it's just really difficult because when you have some time, here at school it's just hard to be like oh i have to sit down and study chess because you want to be doing other things you know if you're going to lectures all day it's not like the first thing you think of let me go to my dorm and study openings you know so um i think i just have to start like setting out a specific time or maybe like working with people to try to get this down but i do want to study more because um i just have to 
get back into chess now. And actually, that's one of the things that we kind of chatted about before we started the podcast. You were mentioning that one of your goals is to, uh, to become an international master. Um, and you actually have a lot of norms. You have six norms, but you never touched uh, the 2400 rating barrier. Um, what's the plan to, 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 to get there? Uh, well, I'm getting closer. I think my rating right now, probably back to almost like maybe like 2350. So still a way to go, but a few good tournaments and you're there. I think I just have my main issue was like a few years ago, I hit like this 2300 with the, the three norms. And I don't think I put in that much work with chess necessary to get here. I just kind of, you know, messed around a bit, had some good performances and got the norms. And then I plateaued because, you know, I need to put in that extra work. So I think now that's just what I have to do. You know, there's no getting around it anymore. Just got to put down those hours and then play a few good tournaments in a row. And, you know, I think I'm there, but that's just, that's just like a one more, you know, stepping stone I have to get over. In the U.S. championship, you had a remarkable result, not only in terms of winning the tournament, but also in terms of the amount of decisive games that you played. I think you had eight wins. Is that correct? Yeah. And yeah. is that a facet of your style? Do you normally have a lot of wins and decisive games and not too many draws? Yeah, I honestly, I don't think like eight games was that much. So I was like, I found it surprising that people were like, oh, eight games is a lot. Because I feel like that's like fairly normal for like my tournaments. Because I don't think I draw that much. Um, I do have more decisive results. And maybe that's just because like, I, you know, I, I like to have exciting games. So that's probably what determines it. But I think especially in um, like, tournaments like U.S. championships, I do have more decisive results in general. I think like in the past few years that I've played, it's always been like that. So I don't really know exactly why that is. Maybe it's just my style of play, but I have no idea. I, is I, it also because the ahead, U.S. championship is so high stakes and you just want to win it so much and it's just like go big or go home. So you're willing to win a lot of games, lose a lot of games potentially as well. Well, also, I just I never play for a draw which is a good or a bad thing, depending, because, like, um, sometimes it's a really bad thing because, you know, I'm, I'm losing a lot during the tournament. And then, you know, maybe it is time to be like, let me cut my losses and try to be solid. But it never really worked for me. Um, like, the, the worst tournament I ever played was this 2019 U.S. Juniors. Lost almost all my games. And then at some point at that tournament, um, I tried to. I was like, okay, let's just be conservative and play for a draw. It was like, it ended up being worse. So after that, I never did it again. So I think that might be one of the reasons, you know, um, like I'm okay with a draw. I'm not against it, but I never try to be like, go into a game and be like, I am playing to draw this game. I feel this is actually one of your biggest strengths because I could, I, I was doing commentary for the championships and I could, I was pretty much looking at your games every single round and I could see that the opening phase, let's say, uh, not necessarily you didn't know what you're doing because... But, <laughs> no, you, you can but, say that because that is literally, that is quite true. <laughs> but, but the opening phase was a bit more difficult. Even with that and with that setback uh, moving into a game, still you were able to fight your way back and I feel this is one of your biggest strengths. Just uh, this attitude of, yeah, it doesn't matter that I get a bad position, I'm still going to fight my way back and um, I'm going to basically will my way back into the game. Is that how you feel about it as well? And how important is your, um, let's say, this this aspect of your mental strength? So that is something that I've kind of also dealt with like my whole life, which is I never had good openings. Like I just, you know, for a long time when I first started playing, um, I got to a you know pretty decent rating without knowing, you know, any openings at all. So I was used to having a worse position out of the opening. So if I wanted to win or draw the game, even I would just have to handle that position and be like, you know, what, how do I make this more um, playable? So, you know, it's, it doesn't really feel a natural for me. Like I remember there was one situation, like my game against Irina in the, that horrible game against <laughs> Irina in round 12. Uh, I was fully aware that I completely misplayed the opening. I was fine with it because obviously the strategy is not the most amazing, but I, you know, in my, all my previous games against her, I was always worse out of the opening. You know, if I think I was usually black, so it's always like plus one, plus two. And then, you know, at some point it gets complicated. There's like some, some tricky things and it might become some balance and then, you know, more playable. So I was, you know, aware of this. So I was like, it's definitely possible to get out of this. Okay. And I think at some point I was okay again until I just, you know, lost my mind, but <laughs> yeah. So 
knowing this, I was just, I'm completely fine um, being in like an unknown position from the opening. Tell me about that game against uh, Nazi Paikidze, one of the champions also, because uh, actually out of the opening, I think you were minus six with the white pieces or something <laughs> like that. And I'll tell you a funny story about it. We have a group chat with Alejandro Ramirez and mm -hmm. uh, another grandmaster. And they actually placed a bet. Uh, that grandmaster is from uh, originally from Georgia. And uh, we're all good, good friends. And they placed a bet on that game when it was like minus six. And Alejandro took your side. Uh, and I think he gave uh, him a draw odds. So you guys made a draw. He got the one hundred dollars. <laughs> so that, that that was pretty funny, though. I remember we were watching this live because I had finished my game. He was like, "It's going to be a draw. I bet on it. It's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be a draw no matter what." Um, and no, so, oh, sorry. Oh no, I was just saying like this happened to me quite often. Like it's actually an issue I really have to you know work on now. But um, at U.S. Junior Girls this summer. I was in a must-win situation. I was playing against um, Sophie Moore Suzuki, who is also playing U.S. Championship. Uh, I think she was she had two-point lead going to the last three rounds, so it was like a you know complete must-win situation. I was blocked, and I just completely played the wrong. And I like played it under like ten seconds. Just completely played the wrong move in the opening, um, and then it was like plus probably plus one or plus two. I don't remember exactly from like move before move 10 yep. and then uh yeah i remember that game <laughs> and then i was like it's fine you know this does not look right but we'll, we'll we'll get out of it um so i think having that mentality is good but you know it's ideal not to be in that situation in the opening yeah i think no. a lot of players they start out with bad openings and then at some point they build their openings up and they still retain those skills of being able to defend difficult positions because no matter what your openings are you're going to to have that sometimes. Speaking of difficult positions, in your Armageddon game against Irina, uh, on the, I, I, what was it, move eight or so, you uh, released the bishop and on g4 and lost a piece instantly in a game that you had to draw. Take us through your thought process. When that happened, were you thinking this game's over or were you thinking I'll still fight on? Well, I mean, I have to be realistic, which is I, I just lost the piece on move eight down a minute in the Armageddon game. It's like pretty much over, but you know, there's always a chance there because it is Armageddon. Um, so I, cause a lot of people came up to me after the game and was like, I'm very impressed that you didn't resign. And I was thinking about it and I was like, I never considered resigning, <laughs> which I mean, surprises some people. But the reason I really thought that was, let me just lose in like three, three more minutes. You know, it's such a short game. Why not just play it on for a few more moves? And then when it's completely over, she trades stuff off. Okay, didn't resign. Because I think it was just also like a matter of principle. Like I was just really mad at myself, um, but I didn't want to give up completely because it's just such a horrible way to end, you know, just at least show a little bit of fight left, you know, make mm -hmm. her think for like another 10 seconds. And then, um, you know, some complications happened and I got chances again. So I feel like that was kind of my thought process. It was just that it wasn't like, it wasn't even just like, oh, I, there might be some way for me to like redeem this game. It was more mainly just like, let me just sit through the next few minutes and then at least like, you know, make a show for it. Um, Cause after I played that, I did, I like, I don't know if it was, if it was on the broadcast, but I kind of just like curled up. Yes. I was just like in a ball. Yes, it was. <laughs> I was literally yeah. in a ball. I just wanted to get out of there, but I was like, let me just sit through the next few minutes. No, for a second, I actually thought that you would be <laughs> resigning at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and but I actually, I didn't think about it. You didn't um, think about it. No, I like, I, I was just like, okay, I'm, you know, she makes a few more moves and then, you know, now down my piece, we, we should resign at some point, but not right now. I mean, this is a super experienced move. Um, can you remember any other moment in your chess career where you were in this type of situation? Maybe even on 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 the better side of the equation. Um, did you ever have any sort of moments like that? I don't think so, actually. Um, I don't think I can't remember the last time I hung a piece. So I don't know like when the last time it happened ever. Um, definitely years and years and years ago. Probably when I was like under two thousand for sure. Um, and you know, it happens towards the tournament. So I don't know what was going on there, but yeah, I I usually do really well in these kind of high stakes situations, which is why I don't mind playing them. I think like I have a really good record in these situations. Like when I'm in a must win situation, I, 
I think there's only been like one instance where I didn't, you know, rise up to the occasion. So um, I I don't think it was a nerf scene. I think it was just kind of like a, you know, tired at the end of the tournament. Um, just, you know, I just had a mental block. I, I don't, I can't understand like what happened. When you're in a difficult uh, tournament or, or even a game situation, are there some ways that you, or some techniques that you use to motivate yourself? Like things you tell yourself that will make you think, oh, I can get through this. I can overcome this difficult position or I can come back from this difficult tournament situation? So I usually, it's weird because it's like a mix of being optimistic and pessimistic because I don't mind, like, you know, I'm in a worse situation a lot of the time. And then when you're used to that, you're like, there's nothing that can be worse than this. Just go for it. You know, if you're, if you think, if you're under the assumption you're going to lose anyways, then you might as well just win. <laughs> I, I said that to someone <laughs> and they're like, that just sounds a little crazy, but I think that's just kind of how I think about it. Cause it's hard for me to explain the way I think about it just because it's like a, um, it is kind of like going through a hoops kind of situation because it's not like a straightforward thought process where it's like, oh, I'm always playing for a win. Cause sometimes you're like completely in a horrible situation. And then if you think about only playing for a win, then it's going to put more pressure on yourself. And then it's like a whole issue. But then if you're like, okay, I'm already lost. Let me play for a win. It seems like it's, easier in a way if that makes sense Fabi, yeah, did you ever, were you ever in that situation can you remember a moment like that well I, all chess players have had that at times right when we've been in, in like really desperate situations so so one thing that when i was a kid i read um this book by jonathan rasson and uh in the book there was a chapter basically coming back from difficult situations and one was there was like a list of things that might help you and one was the theory of infinite resistance which is that if you keep putting up resistance at some point your opponent whoever they are well i mean it it, it won't happen 100 percent of the time but very often they will uh, mess it up because everyone makes mistakes and the longer things go on so i found that if if you're in a really bad position if you just drag it on as long as you can without having to resign at some point and I th i've seen this in, in a lot of uh, players games at some point there is some sort of chance but then it's not also not easy to get that to grab the chance because then you have to play well to to also get the chance when it when it arises so it's a very difficult skill to develop um but I, I was super impressed with how you came back from that because i don't know if i would have resigned but i know a lot of people would have resigned in that mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. and because it, it just seems so hopeless mm -hmm. but you came back and we were watching live and when bishop h2 happened we were already thinking oh maybe it still <laughs> looks bad but maybe there's some chances and then uh like you got that feeling that oh it's getting harder and harder to win and um i mean it, it was an amazingly um yeah an amazing comeback it's funny because she's still winning even at that point but mm -hmm. things are becoming so much more difficult and especially with time ticking down and this was an armageddon situation and you were already catching up on time i think at that point you guys were like close uh very, very even on time how did you feel your chances are at that point? Did you feel like you're getting back into the game? Was this like feeling like a second chance already after you took on H2 and you got the queen? I think it's weird, but I think at that point, I almost had like at least a psychological upper hand mm -hmm. because I just hung a piece and then now it's complicated. So if you're on the other side, you're like, oh, I should have just, you know, simplified and easily won on time. And now, you know, there I have more chances. So you're thinking kind of, oh, let me not like have this slip through my fingers. So... Um, I mean, also at that point, it was just, you know, I already complicated a little bit. Let's just mess around a bit and see what else happens. So, cause I was a bit worried cause it is, you know, still objectively losing, but, uh, I think, I think at some point when she was like shuffling around her pieces, I was like, okay, it doesn't, it doesn't look like as long as I don't get mated in the next few moves, then I'll be okay. And, um, I think that's what happened, but it's like weird. Cause when I look back at the game, I just, it seems so fast, but then I see like myself thinking for a ridiculous long amount of time in an Armageddon game, but I just didn't even realize it because uh, it just time passes so much differently when you're in a seat. And it, it, it wasn't only you. I think Irina was also spending a lot of time and we were watching and we were like, this is an Armageddon game right now. You have to move. Both of you have to move. Did you guys not realize? Do you think like she, for example, did not realize that she's getting down to her last few seconds and even... Uh, physically maybe will not be able to make 61 moves even if she gets like a completely winning position gets your queen and physically will not be able to make 61 moves yeah i think i think we just got caught up in the moment because there were so many 
um, things going on, just like not on, not directly on the board, just like the whole situation with the bishop, just thinking about this stuff kind of made it more complicated. I don't know, because at least for me, I always, whenever I see some other people playing in a time scramble situation, I'm always like, just make this move. It's really obvious. Like, what are you thinking about? But I know if I was in that situation, I would also be spending more time than I would think I am. I don't know if this is like, you know, you, your experiences, but that's always been mine. Yeah, I, I've noticed that too. Like when you're looking at chess from the side, everything seems so easy. Yeah. And then when you're actually in the game, you realize it's really not that easy because it's not just the moves, it's the psychology and the regret and the the worry and uh, everything is just coming together. It's very easy when when you don't have anything riding on the game to uh, to play. Does psychology play a big part? Because you mentioned uh, the psychological factor before. So does psychology play a big factor in your games or is that on your mind a lot when you're playing? I don't think I explicitly think about it, but I do think I'm a pretty psychological player because, well, something about me, I kind of alluded to this earlier, is that, you know, certain parts of my game just like my openings are just need more work and more time in them. Like there's no getting around that, which is, you know, something I'm definitely going to do after this event. But um, because I don't have that, that to work with, I just, I guess I'm a bit of like a, I, I, when I tell people who don't play chess, I just say I like kind of bluff in a sense, which is like, I just do these things that may not objectively be good, but I think will give me practical chances or like, you know, psychological things. So that's just kind of what I've done throughout most of my chess career when I'm in a situation like this, because I have to make up for the fact that I'm lacking in other parts. Speaking of experience and US Championship, we're going to stay on this tangent for uh, for a little bit. Tell us about your first US uh, Women's Champion uh, title in 2019. Oh, okay. I think that was a huge one, right? And you won yeah, it in a gonna... dominant fashion. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were going to ask me about my first US Championship experience. Which no, was... no, no, the, the, the title. <laughs> and actually, I want to, to, to ask Fabi about that as well. But when was your first uh, US Championship? When was the first time you played? Uh, 2015. I... 2015. Thir 13, yeah. 2013. So you were 13 years old. 2015. 2015. I was when 13 you were 13 years old. Yeah. yeah. Got last place. <laughs> <laughs> From last place to uh, to first place, <laughs> and it took you like four years. How was that 2019 one? How was the feeling after mm -hmm. you won that championship? That one was very different from this one because that one, um, I've talked about this before, but it was just kind of a thing that I never expected to accomplish, which was, you know, a lot of people, you know, say to me, they're like, you know, we we thought we definitely thought at some point you were going to get this title. We think you had a lot of chances, especially if your performances performances leading up to it. Because I think the years before it, I had really good second halves of the tournament, and I did okay. I think it was like you know fourth place, fifth place, but it was always the first half that I just like lost so many points. But it was definitely like realistic looking at it, but I just never expected it for some reason. Um, like I know this sounds. You know, I, I'm almost, I have like six IM norms, but a few years ago, I never even thought I was going to get IM. Like it didn't occur to my, occur to me at all until I got my first IM norm. And that was completely by accident. Like I didn't know how to get the norm. And then after the tournament, they gave me a norm. They like gave me a piece of paper and I was like, oh, that's what do cool. I, do I got this? IM norm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what do I do with this? Um, Cause I think this is, this is at the 2017 World Junior. Yeah, tournament like i i didn't know like it was possible um so when that when i um ended up winning the tournament it was just kind of like a huge adjustment i had to do because it was like you know now that this is possible and then at that point i also had all my IM norms so i was like these are two things i never thought i would do um be able to accomplish and now i'm like i got one of them and i'm really close to another one you know if what happens next so it was also kind of complicated because then i felt like i think i put um I felt like I put too much pressure on myself. You know, my tournaments after the U.S. Championship, I did not do that well in. Um, I was also, you know, dealing with a lot academically because it was also my junior year of high school heading into my senior year where I was applying to colleges. So it was just kind of a messy time for me. So it was a huge adjustment. But I think I, you know, finally accepted it over COVID. And now I feel, you know, ready, which is why, like, this tournament just felt, you know, it was like, I already did it once. This isn't too big of a deal. Just, you know, you're capable of it. Mm -hmm. um, you just, you know, if you're in the right um, mindset. How do you approach uh, that sentiment, Fabi? Uh, that moment where you know that you can do this. And how was your first uh, US champion title? 
Yeah, I think um, what Jennifer said about how it's always hard as the first time. Also, people experience this with norms a lot, I think. They get, they're they like thinking that the GM norm or the IM norm is so out of reach and then they get it and they're like, oh, I can do this. And then the next two norms come quickly. And I've seen that, I mean, in, in my own uh, quest for, for norms uh, when I was younger and also for other people, I've heard that sentiment um, echoed. And uh, yeah, I thought it was funny that we we had the same um, like track record in the U.S. Championship. Like we we won once, and then it took a few more years, and then we we won uh, again this year. Um, but for me, it was it was quite quite a great relief. I think when we talked about the U.S. Championship post uh, post tournament, right after I mentioned this, that um, it's been a long time, so it was I was starting to feel like a bit nervous about not having won it in, in so many years. And actually, uh, Jennifer. I think the record holder is Gisela Khan Gresser, if I'm not mistaken, uh, nine times US Women Champion, Irina eight times US Women Champion. Are you uh, thinking about potentially getting there one day? Uh, is that one of your goals? Oh, I can't even see myself in seven years. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, definitely something to keep in mind. I'm not gonna, you know, not not gonna say it's out of reach, but it definitely be a lot of work. And um, I think I also really need to think about like where I see myself like in chess, because um, I get, you know, in college, I get asked about like, where do I want to go with chess? And I really don't know what that is because, you know, I'm in college, so I'm not professional, but I'm also, you know, I still want to continue competing, which is something I just, just started like, you know, this tournament. Um, so I really don't know what is going to happen in the next year or two. It does feel like you have that competitive fire still uh, as as a chess player. Not necessarily still. I feel like it, it's burning quite uh, quite seriously inside you. And do you think you will be able to translate that uh, into uh, your other career, let's say after college, if you ever will uh, go in a different direction? That yeah, competitiveness. I think, uh, yeah, I think definitely like if whatever... Um, you know, passionate about, I will try my best to be successful in it. I like throughout high school and like being in college, like it was always chess. Uh, it was always school first, you know, academics came first and I did chess on the side. So I only thought about, you know, doing chess more seriously when I took a, um, I took a gap year after college because of COVID. And it was weird because I was playing chess a lot, but I didn't really study. So that was not doing good things for my rating. Um, but you know, I, that was only when I started thinking about like taking chess more seriously and continuing chess throughout college. And I took that break last year when I didn't play at all. So it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're figuring it out along the way. On a related note, I, I've noticed that um, a lot of talented young women chess players in, in the United States, especially, um, they rise quickly through the ranks and then they transition to other fields, usually going to university and then uh, and following another career path. Uh, do you do you think there's a reason for that? Is it because chess in the United States for women is not as attractive as other other pursuits? I think that may be one of the reasons. Um, I will say that a few years ago, if you asked me this question, maybe before I won my um, US championship in 2019, I probably would have done the same thing. Um, I honestly didn't think I was going to continue chess throughout college. This was just like a fairly new idea. I think it's just because um, it does seem like there's, you know, kind of, th there's no like leagues or anything here. So mm -hmm. it does seem like, what do, we, what do I do outside, like after this stage, um, other than playing the US championship, you know, I think you really have to go to Europe or somewhere if you really want to continue. So that may be one of the reasons how to make it a career yeah that's that that's always a big question and i feel it's not only for uh, female players but also for pretty much everybody in the chess world and especially here in the us the fact that we don't have leagues in europe it's a bit easier because you travel from country to country if you have like leagues in if you have a team in france in spain in germany already you can feel uh, pretty much uh, a full calendar yeah that's uh, a big one let's uh, take a few steps back when did you first start playing chess. Uh, you were born in New York, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, when did you first start playing chess and how did you start playing chess? Was it your doing? Did you want to play chess or were your parents trying to get you into chess? 
What was the process? So um, I was born in New York, but I learned how to play chess in California. So I moved there when I was around three years old. So I learned how to play chess and chess club uh, at school, in elementary school. And I was actually tricked to sign up for a chess <laughs> club because I didn't really want to do it. And then my parents told me that if I went, I could teach them how to play chess. So, um, you know, I thought, you know, I could show, you know, show my parents I'm better at them than something, at something. But they ended up learning it before I got to teach them. So I was kind of tricked there. But yeah, I went to chess club. Um, I was also the only girl there. <laughs> but so kind of like a little pattern going on with that. But uh, I think the chess club only lasted for one month. So it was really completely random thing. It started, lasted for one month. I learned how to play chess. And then there was no more chess club. So um, it was real. Honestly, I still don't know like how I got into chess. But after that, um, you know, at some point, my parents uh, signed me up for like group lessons outside because there's actually a pretty um, big like chess culture in the California area. There's a lot of kids that uh, play chess. So I went to um, Beyond Chess, which is kind of this chess school, and I just took group lessons and. That's kind of how I started, but it was really um, just one of the many activities I did. It didn't, you know, stick out immediately. I wasn't, you know, particularly good. I just did it along with like art lessons and like, you know, tennis, the other things. When did that did make you... it more difficult being one of the few or only girls in the, in the tournaments that you were playing in? I think you're, um, yeah, I definitely was aware of it because especially when you're at a younger age, I feel like, you know, it's mainly the boys stick to the, with the boys and the girls mm -hmm. stick with the girls. So um, most of my chess friends when I was younger were all the other girls I would meet at tournaments. But um, in California, it was nice because I think there were more girls to, at that time in like the classes um, because they were group lessons and it just happened that way. But I remember, cause I, I didn't think I was gonna play chess that competitively, um, cause I only did like group lessons once a week. And then, you know, my rating wasn't too high for my age. And I remember because, uh, at that time when you wanted, wanted to compete in world youth, I think it would only be the top three kids mm -hmm. in the country. And then I remember, um, the girls from my group would be like Annie Wan and Emily Nguyen, mm -hmm. who are both in college now and I think they don't play as much anymore, but I remember that time they were so, so far ahead of me. I was probably like 900 or like 1600. I just remember looking up to them because me and Annie actually played in the same club. She was like one of my first chess friends. But um, yeah, it was just like completely unexpected when I later on started competing more and then my rating rose up. But I actually think you got good pretty, pretty fast. Uh, you started in 20, 2009 and I think in 2013, you were already like around 2100. And then actually in 2014, you won the uh, World Youth Championship, girls under uh, 12. How was that experience for you? And you were mentioning that only the top three were qualifying and were traveling. Was that the first time you traveled abroad? Uh, no, actually, I played my first World Youth um, in two years before that and when I was 10 years old so that was my first like international big international tournament but I started competing more in chess um after I moved to Virginia when I was nine so um my coach at the time California told my parents you know I think she's talented you should take her to more tournaments so there's actually a lot of tournaments in the Virginia DC area so I just started competing more and I learned openings. <laughs> so that was the thing. I didn't have an opening. And then I learned these openings, which is actually from Yasser's book, Winning Chess Openings. <laughs> what were the <laughs> openings? <laughs> so at the end of the book, he has um, like a little excerpt. So it's like white and then black against b4 and black against e4. So it's like three pages for each opening. But for white, it was knight f3, um, which eventually turned into c4, which I still play mm -hmm. to this day. And then for black, it was perk and I think King's Indian. So, okay. um, yeah. So, so all learned... very similar structures, all very schematic King's Indian type structures. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I kind of switched my openings around, but it was always a kind of like a little bit dubious. Like I went from Perk to um, the Fildor. <laughs> okay, which, but similar still, which is similar a, structure. Yeah, which is, I was just like, I want to keep it, I want to keep the pawn d6, but have e5 first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, oh, the King's Indian just annoyed me. I was like, I want a pawn <laughs> in the center of the board, so that's... <laughs> Slob and just play slob. 
Um, but yeah, so I think it's I one of those know. underrated openings, slightly underrated. The King's Indian. It's really difficult yeah. to handle from the white side. I think I just just having like a little bit of a repertoire, even if it was like three pages, was like still like a improvement <laughs> from having nothing. Because before it was just like you know you look over to the um, board beside you and you're like, oh, they have this position on the board. Seems interesting. I can do that in my next game. So <laughs> that was <laughs> that was how I started out. Yeah, Actually, but... have you ever had, like, you're playing a game and then you see that another game a few boards down or even next board or in the playing hall, they have the exact same opening variation and you're following the same game? Has, has that happened to you? I think it's happened before, maybe once or twice, but um, not enough to, like, where it's, like, you're completely copying them. And how was that but... uh, world world title under 12? Where was that, by the way? Oh, that was um, the South Africa. South Africa. Oh, that's... Yeah, so... That's pretty far. <laughs> how was uh, yeah, how was that? Who did you guys travel with? Who was the coach? Well, was it um, Aviv Aviv Friedman? Because I well, know. Well, I think he... the, the U.S. Federation at the time they would send a group of coaches there, uh -huh. and you would be assigned to a coach. So there, were, I don't remember how many they would have, but the coach, my like actual coach at that time was um, Andranik Matapasian. Mm -hmm. So he was my coach there because you know he was my actual coach. But yeah, so that tournament was. I think it was also quite unexpected. Um, I was also, because this is my third World Youth, you know, the World Youth before, I actually tied for bronze. So I was slowly getting better, but, um, you know, I didn't feel too good going to tournament, but I kind of just went on a roll too. Also won that tournament 10 out of 11. <laughs> so it was like the almost the exact same situation as the US champs, the few um, in 2019. But that was like my first big win. Did you get any sponsors after that? Did you get any publicity in your hometown? Did you manage to translate that victory in any sort of support? I was in the Washington Post. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Was, it was just a big deal for me. Um, I was 12. And then, you know, I had friends at school who came up to me and were like, my mom saw in the newspaper. Uh, so that was um, a really cool experience for me. But I don't think I got sponsored. <laughs> Do you feel that's a that's a that's a problem in uh, women's chess? The fact that a lot of uh, players don't have sponsors, and in chess as a whole, a lot of players don't have sponsors. And how do we address that? I think the sponsorship thing is an issue, but um, I, I, at least from what I've seen the last few years, I think it's kind of changing, especially now that you know, online, you know, online chess is kind of getting more sponsors and more attention. But because um, I think in the past, it was always like, you know, a few certain players that, you know, everyone knew would get all the sponsors. And then there's not like big sponsors for, you know, like U.S. chess as a whole. But I think it might change in the next few years. But there are a lot of factors to keep in mind. I think I don't know. It's a, definitely a complicated issue. It is. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a problem because I mean, I've rarely seen sponsorship opportunities. And I think most chess players haven't because uh, corporations generally don't don't have much interest in chess. It's usually like, you know, one benefactor who who pumps money to chess or or they're interested, but they invest into companies and tournaments mm -hmm. uh, like they they give money to chess.com and chess.com turns a turns that money into a chess tournament. So individual players mm -hmm. gain sponsors. Sponsorship is quite rare in the chess world. I, and I think you actually had some problems with that as well, Fabi. Um and you were like 27 50 and you were still struggling to actually find sponsors that would stay with you for a long period of time um mm -hmm. i i feel that's that that's a big problem or at least it used to be much a much bigger problem um i feel like nowadays especially with the uh, emergence of like twitch streams and and youtube and things of that nature as a chess player you can pursue a lot of uh careers have you ever thought about potentially going that route like doing a YouTube channel or being active on social media? How, what's your relationship with social media and things of that nature? Well, I have thought about it. I actually, you know, might do some more Twitch related things after this because I'm pretty familiar with it. I also um, dabbled in it a little bit a few years ago when everyone was um, during COVID and when it first blew up. You know, I enjoy watching it. I don't really have time to, you know, watch a full stream anymore, but I think it's really interesting, really fun. I really understand social media, I think, you know, as someone who grew up with like 
on social media you know i'm like during the tournament i wasted too much time on tiktok i'm you know i'm like I, i'm here i'm saying I'm, i was stressed about school and chess which is true but you know at the end of the day you're just back <laughs> in bed lying scrolling down tiktok so i do understand it um pretty well so i think that that is something i you know could do because i find it interesting and um i could also you know bring chess in with it and i'm seeing like a lot of you know you know so many people have gone in into like content creation with chess in the last few years so it's definitely something i'm thinking about is it you enjoy that sort of go ahead uh that sort of thing like the entertainment side of chess uh like presenting games or speaking to the public or you know just general like chess entertainment is that something that you enjoy personally yeah like i personally enjoy talking about chess um and i think like sometimes you know something gets recommended to me on youtube and i watch it and i'm like oh this is actually really fun and so i do like this kind of stuff and um also you know i have friends who don't really play chess and then but they got into it because of this route and i think that's really cool because now they're they are interested you know maybe like i i've had people who were like oh i saw um a guy must ever cover your game it's also the worst game ever but <laughs> you cover my game and they're like oh that's so cool i'm like okay, like, you know, you could bring more people into chess in this way as well, which is a really cool thing. And I think I might want to do something where, you know, I can get more girls into chess, because that's something that, you know, I've always been been passionate about. Um, because I think that, you know, it, it is a really difficult and complicated thing why, you know, there aren't as many girls playing chess as got. And um, especially at the younger ages, it's just, you know, really difficult, you know, being like the only 10 year old in the tournament as a girl. I noticed that you have a close friendship with some of the younger, uh, younger players um, like Rochelle. I think you're, you're quite good friends with. Do you feel like you're also a sort of mentor or role model as you're a multiple time U.S. champion and they're they're climbing the ranks? Yeah, I really try to be um, with like the younger ones because I think when I was younger, like when I was you know, 11, 12, I really looked up to the older girls um, because they that they weren't necessarily better at me in chess, but I just I always looked up to them because you know they were they looked at, out for me at tournaments, um, and it was just nice having like kind of like a big sister sort of presence because I'm also the oldest kid, so it was just nice having that as well. So I try to be that if I can. But also, like, I have a lot of really close friendships with other girls I've just competed with because I think it's natural, you know, <laughs> especially since, like, we probably met when we were, like, 9 or 10, and then we kind of um, went to the same tournaments over the years, and you can't really lose that. What What were some of uh, the models uh, that you were looking up to in the chess world? So I really looked up to Alice Dawn. Um, she was a player. I don't think she plays anymore, but... It was always funny because I think I was higher rated than her when I was, um, but she was older than me. But I always looked up to her because I thought she was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think she's she's just such a nice person. And actually, um, Alex Botes, because um, I remember going to a Susan Pogger tournament and she was playing it. And I didn't really know her, but she just seemed like a really cool person. And, you know, when you're like a kid, you look up to everyone who's older than you. And I, I always thought she was cool. And then later on, she was doing a lot of social media stuff. And, you know, now she's a huge streamer, um, which I think is amazing. No, absolutely. She uh, She's a model. And I think she uh, worked with Susan and her institution as well to promote women's chess. And I think that's hugely important to bring more, um, more women in chess. Um, Jennifer. Thank you very much for joining us. I think we covered a lot of subjects. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, what is next for you? What are the next uh, few tournaments for you? Uh, I'm not 100% certain, but I do want to play over my winter break. So, um, you know, hopefully maybe Spice Cup, World Rapid, um, Pan American, the college. If, mm -hmm. I, if we can see and send a team, I'll be really happy to play that. Um, and i guess we'll see <laughs> absolutely should be uh should be a good end of the year thank you very much once again jennifer, you, jennifer. and uh yeah good luck in everything you do